ways that my own research group are working to implement these strategies. And, and it's multifaceted as many things are in our, in our science. Um, so we come at this from a couple different angles. So the first is that we, we, we strive to make sure that we're educating communities about the developmental consequences of what we're finding because we are a developmental lab. We're, we're very interested in how we grow healthy and optimally balanced humans. So this has involved a lot of work in um, classrooms. Um, we've been involved in a lot of different um, kind of offsite um, workshops about um, kind of understanding how the brain works and, and why it's important to protect it. Um, so for instance, this is a, a picture taken at one of our high school outreach events talking about concussion and brain injury specifically. But then we also really recognize the fact that we need to be un amplifying any underrepresented voices. So a lot of this actually comes down to listening sessions and um, inspiring those who are around us that identify as having an underrepresented voice from in whatever way, in many ways, um, to make sure that they have that space to have these conversations. And that ties very well into this idea of training this next generation. So um, we are probably going to push our, our internship, summer internship launch to next year, but this is uh, going to be an opportunity for minoritized individuals to sign up for a summer um, and really do work in our lab. Um, but in addition, we spend every a part of every single lab meeting talking about these topics. We rotate the speakers, we rotate the facilitators of conversation, we are writing up what we're talking about and what that looks like to share with the other communities. And there's one other really important um, piece I want to acknowledge, and I'll talk more about at the end, but we actually currently have a bridge to faculty position here at the University of South Carolina. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to any of the young trainees that are on this call about that. But what we'll spend a lot of time talking about today is thinking about these barriers to participation, um, maybe the ones that are more concrete to address than just the systemic uh, racial barriers that we, we recognize. So I'm going to talk about two concepts. One is research for all and thinking about how we can be inclusive and make sure that people that have um, uh, hair types that are not historically included in EEG work are able to come and participate, as well as some of the opportunities that we've acquired by using mobile practices. So we're going to start by kind of talking about what we do with the technology that wasn't necessarily built for all people. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more at the end about how we've addressed the fact that not everyone can get to us in our university labs. So I just want to start to by recognizing the fact that I, I'm not here to talk to you about diverse hair, right? So brains are things that we study and they sit in bodies that are inside of skull and skin and, and yes, hair, right? But I, I really just want to kind of present this idea of some suggestions to make sure that the EEG tools that we use um, are able to accommodate different hairstyles. And our Ultimate goal is to make sure that no one is ever turned away from an EEG study um, because of their hairstyle. So I wanted to just kind of start by sharing some of our kind of our common hairstyles that we see with hair that is coarse and curly. And this is a beautiful image that um, I purchased from Joey Johnson. So I, I highly recommend um, finding her on Etsy. Um, and I think that this well represents particularly the different ways we can kind of put together coarse and curly hair and you might see it enter your lab. So um, we have voluminous hairstyles that um, we could consider Afro textured or Afro. Um, and then there's a lot of other hairstyles that use different um, processes, whether they're um, permanent or silk press or natural to straighten and um, um, kind of create a, a hair that is more um, smooth or to the scalp, um, including some pixie cuts, asymmetrical bobs. Um, and then others might have shortcuts or fades. So um, more of um, Afro textured hair, but that's kept um, short um, in, in different ways. But then we also see a lot of twist outs and twists in different ways where you're pulling the hair away and kind of creating um, um, these, these um, twists or braids. And then I don't have a really great picture um, here of what locks look like, right? So um, and I, I think Whoopi Goldberg well represents um, a locks wearer for, for most of her career. So we were first kind of confronted with this when um, we recognized that we had a couple of our interns come in and they weren't entirely certain how we could 
conduct EEG on their heads. And so we said, okay, let's have a conversation about how to do this. And it actually coincided with the first um, uh, black and neuro week. Um, and so we actually sat down and we, we joined these conversations. I encourage anyone um, who's interested in this work to find these on YouTube, either from, this is the first year in, in 2021, I believe, but they had recent panels last year as well. Um, and really hear from voices that are, um, that have coarse and curly hair. And um, I want to feature kind of Arnel Etienne, who really kind of identified the fact that they're just organic equipment problems, right? So with coarse and curly hair, what we experience is this kind of like natural spring. And, and here I'm just taking a, a screenshot from her excellent talk. Um, and so she's an engineer. And so she sat down to, to think through, well, how can we actually manufacture electrodes that are going to work with my natural hair, um, because she was working in a lab that also couldn't put an EEG net on. And um, so a lot of the other kind of things that we think about is, well, well when you have Afro textured hair um, and you you're kind of have this natural push and pull of the tension of the hair, um, the electrodes won't necessarily sit flat against the scalp. Um, but we also have some issues that when you have particular braids, particularly if they're a certain thickness, you aren't necessarily going to want to put an electrode at the top of a braid um, because you won't, you'll have enough separation and impedance between what you're recording, what you're trying to measure at the scalp that you won't necessarily have great um, signal. So um, Arnell has some really amazing ideas of, of how to kind of develop new technology that actually addresses these issues from a hardware setup. Um, but we have a lot of reasons for using Magsum EGI, and this has um, been my go-to for my entire career. Um, and we really appreciate the flexibility of these nets, right? So for anyone who hasn't previously used uh, Magsum EGI nets, we have the electrode that kind of that sits at the top um, of this pedestal. And so there's a sponge that um, will help kind of wick um, our ions up to the electrode to improve our ability to um, process signals. And I will defer to all my EGI colleagues for more of the technical um, answers here. But what this realistically creates is an arbitrary net that has some flexibility because it has the, the plastic elastomer that allows for some push and pull. Um, but we do look to place all of the electrodes at once, which is very optimal for the work that we do with infants and kiddos that have extreme sensory sensitivities. So we set out to kind of build a practical guide for how to use this equipment um, and apply it to coarse and curly hair. So I wanted to kind of walk through a couple of tips for what this looks like. Um, so first of all, we, we recommend you always make a plan um, and communicate with other, um, both your participant and with your teammates about what you're going to do. Right. So here's a participant that's come in with locks that are actually cornrowed. And so these made um, some very um, um, high cornrows. So they were about they were probably around five millimeters or so. Um, and that can be problematic for what we do. So here's just kind of a quick video of how we, we place it on on the head. But one of the things that we were doing is, first of all, we um, we we ask each participant before they come in. Um, what kind of hairstyle they have so we can know what to expect and plan accordingly. Um, and when we actually see where the, the cornrows were on this particular person, so what I did is I kind of looked and thought, okay, well, where are these going to fall on the net itself and in, in this kind of two-dimensional space? And where are the regions of interest that we're interested in, in looking at? So we made some decisions and, and we had some kind of um, identified uh, uh, electrodes within these clusters. So what we ended up doing is actually moving the net a little bit so that we had our kind of cardinal points that were between um, a corn row, right? So kind of making that decision to optimize some um, uh, specific electrodes in this moment. This also can look a little funny. So uh, we actually, um, this is a different um, kiddo, but we you can kind of see here in the blue, I'm, I'm trying to, sh to showcase uh, where this person's cornrows sat. And so we had a big valley 
And so we had to use some tape to basically make sure that the, the electrodes that were at the medial sites, which was what our primary regions were going to be pulling from, were able to sit flush against the, the scalp and not necessarily get pulled up. Um, so then we actually also added on a cap on top of that to help encourage everything um, from keeping um, down on the skin instead of um, um, fighting the, the tension and pulling back up. So the, I think one of the primary concerns is how do we address volume in certain hairstyles, right? Well, a lot of times um, we have people come in, particularly with locks um, or twists, and, and this is, these are, or um, afros, and, and these are usually our most voluminous of hairstyles. So you can see here in this little um, kind of cutout what I actually have on all of our run logs. So we do a lot of head circumference measurements. So we'll do a couple just to make sure that we, accurately measured from nasian to Indian, as you can see. Um, and then if you're off by so much, um, then we have you measure a third time. But then we also are measuring at this widest point. So the nasian Indian measurement, we're measuring as close to the skin as possible. So we're lifting up locks or twists and measuring against the, the skin itself. Um, and then this, this last circumference measurement is really just to kind of understand, well, what's the, the maximum um, circumference that we need to accommodate this head? But for the most part, we're picking nets based upon the nasian to Indian measurement. And I'll, I'll show you um, how that works in, in just a couple of minutes here. So I want to talk a little bit about how we actually apply the net. So we recommend what we call a two-person catch. So um, that you have a person who's assisting the net application, um, who stands at the back of the head, and another person in the front. Um, and so here's just a, a video. Let me go back and, and play this video that walks through what this looks like. So the, um, this is a kid that came in with um, awesome locks. And so you can see the person in the back is holding the back and creating a space so that you are accurately getting to the base of the head. And the person in the front, which was me here, um, was able to bring out the net all the way over to the front. And one of the things that we do pretty immediately is tighten the chin strap. Um, I think this is one of the things I tell my interns most often because particularly when you have volume that you're fighting against, you wanna make sure that that's as tight as possible. So either you're holding the chin strap and until you make some adjustments or you're tightening it right away so that you don't lose that progress that you've, you've made on um, putting setting the net on the head. So the other piece that we then do that now you can kind of see us doing, um, and you'll see the well-manicured group that I have with me, is we take some time and we pull out individual um, sections of hair. So um, for this kiddo here, we're pulling out um, either one or two or, or sometimes three or four locks that between these holes um, in the net itself. So you can see that by doing this, this is bringing the net from being on top of the hair to much closer to the skin. Um, and um, ultimately we recommend working from the top and then down to the sides. Here we kind of started at the, the sides a little bit based upon where the volume was. Um, and what this ends up doing is actually creating a fantastic opportunity for that net to stay in place and against the skin. So pulling the locks or sections of hair, you could do this with Afro textured hair. You can do this um, with many, many different kinds of hairstyles. Um, this actually creates a nice opportunity to keep the net snug and in place and against the skin. So the one thing I want to make sure to mention at this point um, is that when you are pulling these sections of hair out, just with any type of hair, you're potentially adding some frizz to it, right? So um, I'll make some recommendations at the end, but thinking about when you're scheduling participants can be really important. So um, if they've just had their hair twisted, they might be a little bit more reticent to come in and actually have you then pull these sections of hair and create potential frizz um, that they just spent um, money at the salon to, to kind of put together. So here's just a couple other examples. So this is a um, two kiddos that had Afro textured hair. It was fairly short, um, uh, as you can see, but you kind of see how we be pulled uh, little clumps through um, um, different sections and thinking strategically about where those are. 
Um, here's a participant that had really long locks, very beautiful long locks. Um, and I was a little nervous at first, um, but we it actually was quite easy. So the difficulty with longer locks is that you just have to be a little slower in how you kind of pull them out through these sections. Um, and we were a little bit more selective. So we actually didn't have to pull out as many in the back um, to, um, um, to feel comfortable with this participant. Here's one more video. So these are um, locks that um, haven't been twisted in, in uh, a little a little bit. So they were um, it was actually the perfect time to kind of do the EEG for this this kiddo. Um, but he had probably the most voluminous um, of locks that we saw. And so it did take a list a little bit longer. So in understanding and um, communicating with your participant about what you're doing and how long it might take is also very important. And as you practice, you'll become more and more kind of familiar with that. So there are going to be some limits, right? So um, I I have uh, the largest size net that is produced by Maxim EGI, the 6164. Um, we are actually thinking about ordering a couple extras and having them stretched out maybe a little bit more so that we, when we have people that come in with quite voluminous heads, we can use the net that's kind of on on that 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 edge. Um, I also would encourage us to kind of think through. Um, should we be going up an extra size, right? Um, some of the, the pieces that I want to kind of recommend is that you also think through um, how you might approach your participants about um, uh, scheduling, like I, I mentioned. So you, you want to schedule your visits with intention. So you want, if you have an Afro textured head and it's a particularly long, so anything um, that is maybe shoulder length is a little bit more tricky. We've had success with things that are um, closer or like a medium to short Afro. Um, but if, if they're considering having their hair braided, um, we recommend maybe thinking about adding this into your grants to either have vouchers to local barbers or, or hairstylists. And I recommend you do some research in your area and understand what those costs are. Because what we don't want is to be able to, to put these nets on our participants and then have them have to go and, and redo their own hair just because they participated in our study. Um, we recommend um, we have people come in maybe before they have a, a um, an appointment for either retwisting or braiding, braiding or tightening. Um, uh, because uh, we know that we're going to be adding a little bit of that static. Um, but I also just want to show that we have one other um, nice video um, of someone who has beautiful Afro textured hair. So you can see the volume here and you can also kind of tell that it really did require this two-handed um, catch so that you have someone in the back who's helping make sure that it goes down um, where it should. And, and I, we did talk to my, my team, I, I would like this to be a little bit more forward and they did do some adjustments um, after the initial cap, but you can see that it's, it's not a, um, it's not a, a game ender, right? So we're, we still are able to um, have people who have very voluminous hair participate. So the other thing I would just want to mention is that we have had uh, um, several participants come in that had lace in or glue in wigs. Um, and, you know, it's it's also, again, not a way it's not the end of the world. Um, what we did is take took very specific notes about what where the the um, wig sat and what those sections looked like and corresponded back to um, our EEG net um, um, map. Um, and I want and. And part of this is just thinking a little bit creatively. So if you are going to be, um, let's say, doing a mastoid reference, and that's partly where the lace in is, then that actually, you might want to rethink that, right? So there's a couple of analytic strategies that we can take to be a little bit more creative. Um, you can think about within person change because um, you you would expect um, that the signal might be a little bit different for a person with a wig versus a, a person who doesn't have, isn't wearing a wig. Um, and this is just a quick little video. I recognize that this person had very big blinks and um, it's not maybe the, the um, there's some movement issues here, but I just wanted to showcase the fact that despite the fact that they, they were wearing a wig, we, we still saw very, very nice signal um, um, throughout a very long session. So this is taken at the beginning of the, the session, but I also looked after an hour and um, it still looked just as great. 
So what are our goals? So we put together a paper um, that I'll talk about here in a minute, and we created this guide. So not only are these videos hopefully helpful to just kind of see how we are executing it, we thought through all of the pieces and the advice and how we trained our interns and wrote this down for you. So in our Frontiers in Neurology paper, you can um, pull out this, this supplemental guide that's online and actually follow those steps. So I recommend having a lab meeting with your team, talking through some of these pieces so that you're prepared to, to address that. So let me talk a little bit more about this study because we are very proud of, of its success. This is work that was done in, in conjunction with my colleague, Dr. Jessica Wallace at the University of Alabama. Um, and we really were looking to understand racial disparities in um, um, pediatric head injury and concussion specifically. So this was kind of a pilot project that we put together to just um, to, to do some baseline collection. Um, the project's kind of on hold because I, I switched institutions in the, um, after this first season. Um, but I think it well reflects where we're headed and how to do this work. Um, so we really utilize these community-based participatory research practices, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and our goal was to understand how the brain changes and might be impacted by history of concussion. Um, so fortunately, none of our um, athletes that participated in this season actually experienced a concussion. Um, but we do have many that had um, a large history of, of um concussion-based symptoms. Um, as we know that um, African-American and Black students tend to have underdiagnosed rates of concussion and head injury. So um, we take those symptoms that they self-reported quite seriously. So the most majority of our participants did have coarse and curly hair. Um, we had maybe one or two that had very, very short hair or um, buzz cuts. But for the most part, we um, a lot of these videos were pulled from this project that we completed at the local high school, as you can tell from this uh, Gatorade bucket in the background. So we wanted to come um, to approach this work by using this community-based participatory research strategy. And not everyone knows what that is. I thought I'd take a minute just to kind of explain our two guiding principles and, and how we approach that. And really, this is coming to hit this first piece, this first barrier that I mentioned, which is how do we address um, trust in science? Um, and so for us, it really was about establishing a relationship, you know, and that had to come first. Um, and we actually, if you think about it, we started this whole project maybe a year before we put the first cap on a kid because we were talking with the community leaders, the coaches, um, um, about what it was that they, they needed in their group. So thinking about this is, okay, well, what is our goal in science as also being derived from what the participants need and the community needs, and then how that reflects back to the science that we do and how will we communicate that in a very reciprocal um, manner. So here's some of the strategies that we took for this specific study. We went to the football games. We were there on Friday night and cheering them on. We learned everyone's name. We met the parents. We met the coaches. We came to practice and we brought watermelons. Um, we talked with everyone about, well, what, what do you want to know at the end of the study? What do you want to see in return for participating? Um, and what are those questions? So here we're, we were interested in looking at emotion regulation in this paper, as well as understanding kind of memory correlates. But what is important for you to learn from us? What can we be teaching your, your students? What can we be teaching your parents? The other important piece here is that we use very active recruitment strategies. We, we, I don't know that we even created a flyer, to be honest with you, or, or an email. We were there in person and interacting with, with the, the uh, participants that we were going to be working with. And we had these ongoing relationships that we were developing with the coaches in particular at first, and then stemming out into the parents as the game started. Um, we also made some TikTok videos. Um, and this is um, done by my colleague, Dr. Wallace. Let me turn the, the volume off on this. We use really fun music and, um, you know, put together some graphics. We're not necessarily social media mavens, but we were able to kind of 
put together something in a way that they were able to see and recognize that the work that they were doing was leading to something. Um, so we we filmed these at the first visit and then reminded them and showed them their, their TikTok videos um, when they came back for the second visit. Um, the other thing I would just rec recommend is that find your advocate. So for us, we approached the quarterback of the team separately. And this is you know a, a peer leader kind of self-nominated as one of the captains of the team. And we talked to him about the study before we talked to the entire team at once, right? So um, you want to also be rewarding and, and finding ways of valuing that advocacy relationship um, as well. So we put together um, a guide. I'd recommend everyone to do something similar. People are going to be more likely to participate if they can see what it's going to look like. So when you do have people come in that have braids or twists or locks or Afro textured hair, make sure that they're, you're talking with them about um, and, and potentially asking if you can use their images in things like this so that future kids and adults can see what it looks like for someone like them to participate. So in the study, and in, in the feel free to kind of dig through the paper, um, we pulled out a couple of different individual ERPs, and it's even hard to kind of see the um, standard error bars around these waveforms, but we, we had great signal. We were very kind of proud of, of our ability to, to capture this data, and we found some really interesting um, scientific evidence of the N2 component in particular as being responsive. Um, to motion regulation. So as you became more and more frustrated with our go, no go frustration task, we saw that a diminishing of the N2 component that corresponded with how, how frustrated they felt. So in this last little section, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the other big piece of this, which is getting out of the lab and to the community. So in this study that I just kind of mentioned and in, in the kind of formative work of creating these guides, we were at the local athletic trainer's office. So that's why you see um, big bags of, of, of training equipment and Gatorade tubs and, um, you know, uh, athletic training benches and, and all of the videos. Um, so we set up where they were to really reduce the need for them to come to us. Um, and I've also done some work in our autistic populations and kiddos that have rare genetic mutations that I think also really emphasizes what this mobile testing opportunity looks like. So let me just spend a couple minutes talking about that. And I can think of no better way to set this up by introducing you to Ethan, who's this little boy here on the left. So when this picture was taken, he was six years of age. He has a mutation that affects the SCN2A gene that is linked to both epilepsy and autism, but he's an amazing kid. He is a great older brother, but he's non-speaking and non-ambulatory. And so particularly with such a large household, it becomes really tricky for them to um, um, pick up from where they live to come to wherever we are in the lab. So what I did is I went on the road. So some of you might have heard me talk about our, our road trip. So we packed up our EGI system and went on the road and went into people's houses and, and did our research testing. So here's just a little video of, of Ethan participating. You can see that he's we, we chose where to put the equipment. Um, and, and I have lots of ideas about uh, how to kind of think through some of the setup pieces. Um, but importantly, what this is allowing is, is putting this in a place where it's a context that is important for him, right? So, and I, we, we really do think that this is going to be the next wave of, of the future, particularly as we start to kind of develop biomarkers for groups um, that have particular limitations when it comes to transportation. So whether or not it's in the house or at hotels in a local area or at a hospital, we really do encourage this consideration for using these mobile testing strategies. So it's a great comfort that kiddos get to sit and be in their, their safe space. They have all of their preferred animals. Parents have all of their preferred snacks on hand. It's greatly reduces the burden for the participants and their families there is some challenge. There are some challenges though, right? So we are, we're not necessarily setting up um, in our controlled 
empirically derived environment. Um, so you have to be very careful about how you set up. You also have to be very technically savvy to be able to set it up successfully every single time. And there is um, some time involved in that, right? So it usually takes um, anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour to get it set up without any sort of errors. But um, we're just really proud with the signal quality that we've seen. So to kind of highlight this, this was the, the road trip that I took. So I, I packed up my car and um, in everything that I had for EEG fit into these two suitcases with a stand-up paddleboard just, just for scale. So these came in and out of the car with me um, and we drove around the country and, and uh, meaning I drove around the country. And so we were able to see um, in just three months time um, over 55 individuals. Um, and so this is across, I think, maybe 51 or so families. So setting up the equipment um, multiple times. Um, we had great success. And, and this is a population that sometimes burns out where we don't necessarily aren't able to have them complete all of our experiment. They did great. So I would I think that there's maybe only one kiddo who wasn't able to wear the net, just extreme sensory sensitivities. Um, and it, it just never was going to work for that, that child at that time. And that's okay. Um, so we were very, very proud. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to skip this video, um, except to just show you this first part um, where it, I kind of sped up how I put together the system. So I did, I practiced a lot actually. So I wanted to get really, really fast at doing this all by myself. And so I had kind of a goal of how I would approach every new environment and put things together. Um, and then you can watch the rest of this video on my website if you'd like to see lots of cute videos of, of kids getting capped. So we had a lot of lessons to learn. So there was a, um, a big need for flexibility. So this kiddo on the left, her happy time is 530 in the morning, which many of you might know is not my happy time. So I was there by 5 a.m. and set up so that she was at the breakfast table and we had a pancake breakfast and I fed her pancakes as we collected data. And when the pancakes were done, we were done with the EEG part. Um, and so it was really successful and and um, um, and lovely. She, we had a great time um, despite the early morning. We also had many kids that really were uncomfortable with the EEG process as some of you might experience. So you can see I put on a net for this example. We also have other examples Examples where we, we use teddy bears that got to wear nets. Um, and this is a kiddo who um, was really uncomfortable and dissatisfied and kept trying to run away. We realized he just wanted to stand. So we had him stand for the entirety of, of his EEG session. So if I was going to boil this down to a few kind of lessons learned, this is a difficult thing to do, the mobile testing, um, particularly as one person. So I, I'd recommend curating a team. Um, and that's because you have to be able to wear multiple hats and not just your 1020 hat, as uh, Mark was joking earlier. Um, you need to be able to figure out how to help the participants in the, this space and the parents in this space. You need to be able to troubleshoot and um, understand when things are, the quality isn't looking great. You have to do all the paperwork. Um, and really, it comes down to kind of energy. So the, it was um, incredibly um, financially, um, um, it was much, much cheaper for me to do this as one person. Um, but there's all of those kind of hidden costs to think about. And really, it comes down to hiring a team that is incredibly personable and flexible. So my main recommendations for those that are interested in doing this work um, is to really plan ahead and so have long conversations so the parents know, show them videos of what to expect and give them some ideas about where you might want to test in their space. For um, example, if you're doing the home visits, um, but not to be afraid of this, right? So it, like anything, it just takes some practice and time and training. And I'm happy to share um, the um, more details about these lessons that, that I've learned over time. Um, and it does take some, some work to really be trained. So when I'm training my team, I go walk around and I unplug cords and I see how long it takes for them to figure out that something's unplugged um, because you need to be able to troubleshoot very quickly in those moments. Um, and despite being in the field now for a long time, you make mistakes, bring extra cords. Um, I lost two laptop uh, power cords 
in this process, um, which were luckily very easy to replace at the nearest Best Buy. Um, but I really recommend having some checklists there. So just to kind of like wrap up, I hope that I've I've touched upon these these different issues. These are not necessarily the only issues um, or barriers to inclusive participation, but I think that there's some some key ones that are easily addressed, or at least um, there's pieces of this that we each can address um, in our day to day operations in, in this space. So some other ideas to just to get you thinking, um, I am trying to put together our first inclusion and neuroscience salon with a purposeful um, uh, play on words here, where we bring in scientists and our trainees, as well as hairstylists and kind of show them what we do and get their advice and feedback and, and um, learn from them about um, more inclusive things that even, even better things that we can do to be inclusive. Um, I also recommend having these conversations regularly. This isn't, um, this needs to be conversations that we have ongoing and that we're constantly learning from and teaching and training the next generation to be ready to address these issues. So we have uh, what I call like a special it, um, interest or special issue group that's dedicated to inclusion and in neuroscience. So that's really kind of what we, we focus on in, in my lab. And it's important to know what your specific community needs are. Um, so one of the big questions we ask a lot of times are, are rural areas, um, are they separate and are they different from some of the urban needs? So even in populations, um, that we might be able to address by doing this mobile testing, we might still need to make some additional accommodations depending on, um, specific needs of each community. And I cannot emphasize enough that we as neuroscientists need to be adopting community-based participatory research strategies, which is not something we learned in grad school. So it's something we have to teach ourselves. So just a quick final wrap up. I really do think that I, I see some great promise of where we're headed as a field um, to be able to um, really address and, and be pushing towards how we are developing biomarkers for, for my own interest, but even just how we understand the brain. We need to be understanding the brain in all people. So we can't necessarily leave anyone out. So it's important to um, access and, and reduce those barriers as best we can. Um, and with that, I think I'm a little over time, but I'm going to go ahead and stop by, by thanking our team. Um, so this is the team I trained in Alabama. I need to update with our South Carolina team. And I want to thank our funders and the families for all of their hard work. And as we learned how to do this, um, participants were absolutely instrumental. Um, and then lastly, I will put, um, or if anyone has interest or is a um, postdoc currently or about to graduate and is interested in kind of thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of your primary practice. We have a bridge to faculty postdoc position. Um, we just reopened it yesterday. Um, so you have to apply by April 4th. Shoot me an email, let's talk about that. So with that, I will turn to the Q&A and see if we have any questions. Thanks so much, Caitlin. This was so insightful and it's, it's so good to see your dedication of traveling across the country and you know i think you put in every possible effort to make this possible so Thank it's you. really great to see that mm -hmm. so we do do have some questions um and kind of expected um so amanda from boston children's um, do you soak the nets for an additional amount of time knowing that the electrolyte electrolyte adjustment may take a bit longer to pull braids through yeah, so for us with, um, particularly when we're, we're doing work with um, pulling any sections of hair out, um, we tend to stick with like the, about a 10 minute soaking time in the bucket, um, but we tend to need to um, add water um, su substantially. So I would recommend pulling the hair out before rehydrating the net as best you can. Um, and we usually pause and the person who's running the computers will, will let us know and um, the person who's sitting with the participant between experiments if we need to rehydrate. Um, so a lot of times, once you've pulled the sections out and have rehydrated the net, you're pretty good to, to go. Um, we actually tend to use less shampoo than most. 
Um, but there are some instances where you might want to use a little bit more shampoo depending on, um, and it, it just comes how, how the person comes to you. So we recommend people not to put products in their hair ahead of the visit, but if they do, we might add some extra shampoo. Um, and I also know that Laurel is working with, um, Shea Butter a lot in her work in South Africa, we haven't necessarily adopted that as a steady practice, but um, the idea there is that you could apply Shea Better ahead of net application um, to help, um, I, I think, largely in kind of creating a space for the electrodes to sit on the scalp. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, that's good. Well, um, <clears throat> another question from the same person with the afro textured hair, which is shorter. Um, do you have any advice for adjusting electrodes or just wiggling, trying to get the pedestal closer to the scalp? The the general like head massage wiggle is definitely like our go-to first um, piece. Um, and a lot of times uh, I would I would be purposeful about the direction that you do it, right? So like in the video that I showed um, where they had the net too far back, um, we actually made some adjustments first to try to bring the net forward. I, we just don't have it on video um, to have the placement be a little bit more aligned. So if you're working with upper textured hair, you don't want to like start from the front if it's already too far back, right? So you want to kind of think through. So a lot of times we start at the vertex and kind of work our way down in a unified way. Um, and another thing I didn't quite emphasize is that sometimes we have two or three people working on this part at once. And that's just to keep the speed up, right? Um, you could do this as one person. I really recommend the two-handed catch. Um, and actually we do it almost for every person now because it just goes, it's just so much easier to get really great placement that way. Um, but have three people, right? So once you kind of start, then everyone kind of has their own section to work on. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And then there's, Another question, which is actually you just answered the same, the same question was, how do you work with after textured hair at the back? Like, how do you work with that? And especially with the video that you showed, I think you already answered that. So I think, Patrick, your question kind of well, answered. I'll make one comment because um, a lot of times our instinct, even with me, I, I have fairly thin-ish hair, but we'll push our hair back and so that you have a lot of mass in the back of the head. So um, when we're pulling sections out, we're also thinking strategically. So it might not necessarily be, be coming out of the closest hole. We might try to spread the, the back of the hair so that it's just better distributed. Um, because I think that you, you do wanna kind of, <laughs> it's where the volume is and kind of distributing the volume as best you can, whether it's pulling out or even kind of, sometimes like we'll pull hair forward for that reason as well. So there's a, there's a question on consent of taking images. So how do you ask the participants if you could share their images? Is it a consent form? Yeah, so you can see that I blurred out or obstructed the faces of everyone in our um, the most recent paper, right? Because we didn't necessarily have explicit consent, but we're, um, they did see in the consent that we could use their unidentifiable images in their consent form. All the other kiddos, um, I have usually email families directly and ask if it's okay to use their, their images and, and describe. And you see not everyone says okay. And I understand, particularly for kiddos that have high anxiety, I'm not ever going to use their likeness. Um, so I, I think that there's a, a bit of, and that comes back to the community building, right? So it, um, particularly with our genetic kids, these folks know me, I'm in their house, I'm drinking their coffee, um, I'm moving around their furniture. So we have a very special relationship. Great, thanks Caitlin. Um, a question on net sizing. Um, so the question is, are you basing your net, uh, choosing your net size on the, Asian Indian measurement, because you did mention about that too. And are you sizing up when necessary with Afro textured hair? So Afro textured hair is the only instance that I think that we've thought or considered of sizing mm -hmm. up. Um, with braids and twists um, and locks, a lot of times you want to keep your nasi into Indian measurement because you're actually going to end up fitting close to the skin. But um, we have had some participants come in to the, I think that the 
that one video that we have of applying the net to um, the Afro textured hair, um, we went to our maximum size. That was as big as we could get, right? Um, and so you, you, we were kind of limited there. We might have decided to size up one, depending on how, how thick the Afro textured hair is. And um, like she had hers all kind of pulled to the back. So she had kind of a, um, um, she wore her hair kind of flat in the front and then thick and natural and curly in the back. So um, when you kind of, you have to kind of adapt a little bit to what the situation is, but I would try not to size up unless you're either on the cusp um, or you have particularly voluminous hair um, where you don't know that you could even with a two-handed um, approach that you could get it around the hair is I think the other kind of issue there. Yeah. And I think all your nets are, are the normal routine nets that we have. Like the Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. I use only the, I currently only have the low impedance or um, the low, um, low profile, the normal ones. Yes. Yeah. I have the normal nets, the low profile ones. I, we aren't currently using the long pedestal nets just yet. Um, but that could be a way of approaching um, really thick voluminous hair. Right. So th there was a question about that. So I specifically asked you that. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about impedances? Like, do you get impedance? Like what percentage of sensors are typically good? Yeah, so I, I think in part because I've been using this system since 2010, um, we really are just, you know, we, we try to get impedances under 200 kilo ohms as a starting point. Um, we aim for 50 if we can, but we're satisfied if it's over under 200. So um, particularly if electrodes are going to sit on a uh, cornrow or a braid, we're going to have issues. Um, and we just know that. So that's one of the reasons why I really suggest like, if, like kind of trying to like think through and we actually have a printout on our run logs of the net. So if we see that there's a corn row that, or a row of electrodes that are sitting on a corn row, for example, we mark it so that we know we're never going to get great impedances and we move on. So because of the high density and our analytic strategies to cluster electrodes, um, we are able to do that where we're either kind of adjusting the net and, and making just clear indications of how these pieces are together. And um, we're really leaning in part because of the mobile testing and, and some other pieces, we're really leaning on within person differences at the outset. So we're looking at condition differences within a person as opposed to um, collapsing across condition across people. So there's some creative, like that gives us that wiggle room to be a little bit um, more selective about how we're placing the net and um, what thresholds we're willing to accept. Um, we don't want, because people have braids, locks, twists, and they have, we, it takes us a little bit longer to put the net on. We don't want that to be a negative experience of of the, the whole procedure. So we do, that's partly why we use three people sometimes is just to keep the speed up to it's commiserate with um, um, other, other heads. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> the question about children with matted, tangled hair, uh, it may be difficult to pull their hair to, how do you address that? And with more challenging and hypersensitive populations? Yeah, so we haven't encountered that ourselves. So I'd be interested if um, anyone else has kind of ideas to, um, we could open that conversation up somehow. Um, I think that that's partly what the shea butter is used for. Um, I just haven't adopted it myself. So I don't quite know what to recommend there. Um, but I think that if you have particularly matted hair, that's thick, um, you might want to think about loosening it with some product like Shea Butter first. Okay, that's good. I think it answered two questions more. Which is good. <laughs> Someone had asked about Shea Butter, which is good. <laughs> yeah. And there's a very obvious question, which are like, how could it not come? What happens to your nets? Do they get refurbished or replaced very often because of the way they used? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. So it comes down to the elastomer, right? And that's been um, the most difficult piece. But I actually work with. We're having more issues with our elastomer with some of our um, our populations that are super sensory sensitivity sensitive or non-speaking. 
So like pulling at the net is by far the fastest way to kill a net. And um, um, we're, we're starting to think through like, how can we potentially bolster nets that have gotten stretched? But I think we're also thinking about, well, maybe that there's an advantage here. So we keep track of every net use um, and we check its health every month. Um, and as the elastomer gets maybe stretched because we've accommodated hair, we indicate that. So we've, we've got like a little sticker system that we're going to be using to indicate like the, the, the buoyancy or the stretch of the elastomer. The idea is it, it still becomes a viable net particular, but maybe you, you buy a second one for people that don't necessarily need have volume accommodations you need to make. Um, and you use that one, um, specifically for, for work with, um, um, twists and locks and in volume. Um, yeah. Cause again, it's, it's just hair, right. It's just trying to understand how we, how we manage our, the equipment. Yeah. And I think I also like to add that, you know, the way you've been using and the videos that we saw, um, I think using two people to do it against one and, you know, uniformly stretching the elastomer uh, helps in the life of the net and, you know, pulling only one side of it. So I think that the way you've been using it really matters and that kind of defines more of its health. And mm -hmm. um, that's why uh, the careful attention is so much important. Mm -hmm. Going to more questions, we have five more minutes, so I'm just going to pick some. Uh, No, I can answer some of these are asking questions about maybe our minimally verbal and um, intellectual disability populations um, about like movement. So we, I've gotten really good. I mean, I had to do all the netting myself because I was traveling solo, um, but we've gotten really good about getting the net set in your hands and knowing where your thumbs are around the nasian. And then you just track, you track the head, just like we do with baby um, netting too. You do as best you can, but knowing that they're going to be wiggly and crying potentially or anxious, um, we try to get it on as quickly as possible um, and then redirect attention back to something positive. So, um, uh, and I, I do have plenty of videos of me putting on nets with babies crying or with kids crying, but I can guarantee, um, I don't think I had anyone who was crying at the end of a session, like, like continuously through a session. Um, so usually it's, it's just a matter of, of um, putting in the work and, and putting the, the kiddos in a space of comfort, right? So being in their home on their couch and putting the net on there is way easier than bringing them into a strange room in a university lab. So it's much, much easier. And then the other question about the refrigerator, yeah. I bring around a sniffer with me. I think that that's what Nathan Fox calls it. I call it to the kids, my ghost meter, and we look for electromagnetic fields. Um, so um, I have a whole kind of tutorial about like how we set up the amp and what we look for. We're, we're putting that together in another paper that'll hopefully come out soon. Absolutely, perfect. And there's one question about hair styling. Is there a particular style that you recommend for better net application? <laughs> I don't think, I think that it doesn't, it doesn't come down to the hair. It just comes down to your skills. So just practice, right? So bring in some friendly heads. And this is another reason to get to know the local hairstylists and barbers, because it probably is going to require your team to practice a little bit, right? So if you don't have those folks um, in your lab already, um, bring in some friendly heads and you you develop the skills. Um, I will say that when you have particularly long Afro-textured hair, it can be helpful for any sort of braiding or twists. Twists are easier than Afro-textured hair at a certain volume. So um, if they're interested in that, that's where I really recommend thinking through like a voucher program or some sort of discount um, or, or fully just give them money to go pay to have their hair redone at the end of, um, or to have their hair braided for the study. Yeah, I'm sure people will be happy and they'll have no actuations then. And um, so someone asked if this, uh, we're gonna send this PowerPoint and recording. So this will be on our YouTube channel. So you can always go and subscribe to Max to Media YouTube channel and you could find all the webinars out there. So, 
Um, again, a question about, I think this will be the last one that we'll take. Uh, do you mark the cortex on the, probably they mean vertex on the kids' heads before putting the neck? That was my training in grad school, but we've moved a little bit beyond that and um, are kind of adopting some of these multi, multi-site multi consortium rules where we really are looking for the nets to be well-placed in the front because people have different skull sizes and shapes, particularly when you're doing baby work. Um, their heads are all different kinds of shapes. So um, we don't necessarily mark for VREF. Um, we are more looking, we have other metrics for um, assessing that placement fit. Although I think that that could be an interesting strategy, um, particularly if you're working with cornrows to maybe identify where those cornrows are by measuring the vertex and then and like reporting distance from there. We end up just taking a lot of pictures when we can. Um, of how the net sits, particularly on um, on heads where we had to make these kind of adjustments. Yep, I think we're good on the question and answers. Um, thank you so much, Caitlin. This was really, really insightful. And it's great to see your dedication in there. I'm, I'm gonna hand over this to Ronnie now. Ronnie, you're on mute. <laughs> There, finally, and I'm unmuted. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, Dr. Kudak, this was amazingly insightful. I think we all learned a lot, and I think it's just so incredibly important what you're doing. So keep up the good work. Uh, everybody in the audience, thank you for joining. If you have topics or ideas that you'd like to see in a future Mags to Me GI Academy, please reach out and let us know. Meanwhile, Happy spring to everybody and uh, be healthy. Thank you so much. Bye now.